Good afternoon and welcome to Colony Lutheran Church in Newbury, South Carolina. This is a copy of our service from for Sunday, September 13th, and I hope that this service will be a blessing for you today. My name is Michelle Fisher. I am the pastor at Colony Lutheran Church. And um, again, glad to have you with us today. We begin our service with confession and absolution. Please join me. We begin in the name in which we are baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John writes, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please take a moment for self-reflection. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God, and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble. Cast away our transgressions and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the name, hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading today is actually Psalm 103, verses 1 to 13. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He makes his ways known to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. 
He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor does he repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, Lord and Savior, open now your saving word. Let it burn like fire within us. Speak until our hearts are stirred. Alleluia, Lord, we sing for the good news that you bring. Our gospel today comes from the God, from the book of Matthew, beginning in the 18th chapter. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the, sin, of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said, no, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions. But the man pleaded with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And then out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him that large debt. But that same slave went out, and as he went out, he came upon a fellow slave who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay me what you owe me. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But the first refused, and he threw the second into prison until he would repay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they reported it to their Lord all that had taken place. And then the Lord, the king, summoned him, the first slave, and said, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. About a month ago, my husband, Neil, and I went down to the Isle of Palms in South Carolina for an overnight trip to celebrate our wedding anniversary. And while we were down there, we found ourselves in a Barnes and Noble, a nice large Barnes and Noble. And we went and wandered around the aisles for 30, 40 minutes or so. Now, he went for coffee, and he looked at the magazines, especially the tech magazines, and I started in science fiction, looking at the new titles, and then moved over to the travel section to see what the RV, what they had on RVs and camping. And then I went into the religion section, where 
a book by Philip Yancey jumped out at me, figuratively speaking. The book was entitled Vanishing Grace. Now, Philip Yancey begins that book with these two sentences. I began with a concern that the church is failing in its mission to dispense grace to a world thirsty for it. More and more surveys show outsiders view Christians as bearers of bad news and not good news. So among non-Christians, most perceive Christians as the bearers of bad news, not the good news of Jesus Christ. And this bothers me, because how can we invite others into faith when we are seen as the bearers of bad news? Now later, Philip Yancey shares a quip he heard from comedian Kathy Latham. All religions are the same. Religion is basically guilt with different holidays. Now, after seeing this book in the Barnes and Noble, I, I went and downloaded it from Audible. And I was listening to this as I drove in uh, to the office last week. And when I heard that line, I laughed out loud. It's funny. And it's sad. Because Jesus didn't come to us peddling more guilt. Jesus came to share the good news. In fact, the very first gospel written, Mark's gospel, begins with that statement. This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. We'll hear this again in a few months, but this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. And the good news of Jesus Christ is not guilt. In fact, the good news of Jesus Christ is exactly the opposite of guilt. It is forgiveness. It is grace. Philip's, Philip Yancey's book is a call to us as Christians to remember that we are called to proclaim the gospel, the good news, the grace of God. We are called to proclaim a God of hope and a God of joy. But sadly, the God of grace is vanishing in the world. You see, religion is not about guilt, although it has been sold that way. And we kind of go through this push and pull in church history where we forget this and someone reminds us. As Lutherans, we celebrate that Martin Luther discovered, rediscovered the good news, that our God is a gracious God, a loving God, a forgiving God, a God does, who does not hold our sin against us. Luther struggled to believe that God loved him. He was hyper aware of every little sin every infraction, and every bad thought that he harbored towards those around him. He drove his confessor crazy. Father, forgive me for it has been three minutes since my last confession. Luther, what are you doing here now? Well, I had a bad thought. Brother Thaddeus came in from the garden and walked all over my wet floors and that I had just finished watching, and, and, and I just, I'm, I'm really angry at him, and I had bad thoughts about him. Yeah, that sounds like Brother Thaddeus. Yeah, well, um, okay, Luther, say one our father and go away, and I don't want to see you back here for at least another hour. I may exaggerate a little, but the idea was that Luther was obsessed. He could not imagine that God loved him. And he was convinced that he was destined for hell. And then he was sent to Wittenberg, where he had the opportunity to read the scriptures for himself. And God spoke to him through Paul's letter to the Romans. 
For Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not one is righteous. We sin. We are sinners. We make mistakes. We hurt people every single day. And God loves us anyway. God loves us despite our failures. Now, every denomination is a gift to Christianity. I like to think about this in terms of the body of Christ, and each of us are members of that body with different tasks and abilities. And, and so Pentecostals, they like to remind us that the Holy Spirit is powerful and joyful. And the Roman Church, which is my term for the Roman Catholic Church, they excel in deep spirituality and contemplation. Methodists gave us the small group method ministries. And as Lutherans, we are called to remind the world of Christianity that Christianity is not based in guilt, but is based in grace. We are called to remind the world that Christianity is not based in guilt, but in grace. And yet we in the church return again and again to a guilt-driven theology, a theology of fear that imagines God as an angry ogre ready to cast us into the fires of hell. You just think about that sermon that Jonathan Edwards preached of the, the spider hanging over the, the fires of hell. Um, God used Luther to remind the world of grace, of forgiveness. Forgiveness that is applied to us time and time again. But this understanding of God's grace, of the undeserved love of God for all humanity, was not new in the first century. Jesus wasn't telling the world anything new. In fact, Jesus was repeating what the poets and the prophets had proclaimed hundreds of years before. Psalm 103 comes to mind. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord who forgives all your iniquities, who redeems your life from the pit. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse. He will not keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor does he repay us for our iniquities. For as far as the heavens are high above the earth, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. There's something about that last line. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed his transgressions. It always kinds of blows my mind a little because we're talking about where does the east begin where does the west begin it's it's almost hard to fathom that kind of distance the point being we are forgiven our sin is not held against us by god and this is present from the very beginning of the Bible. When Adam and Eve disobey God, and God is forced to cast them from the Garden of Eden, he takes a few moments and makes them a set of clothing. That's an act of mercy. There are consequences for their actions, their removal from the Garden, but their sin is not held against them. God still loves them. And his disappointment with them did not change that love. 
And isn't that what forgiveness is about? It's about saying to someone, I still love you, even though you hurt me, even though you betrayed me or you lied to me. Forgiveness is not the undoing of our actions. It is not the negating of consequences. I think as, as younger people, we tend to think that if we are forgiven, the consequences of our actions go away. And I want to be clear, that is not true. Forgiveness does not negate the consequences of our behavior. And we can see that in the story of King David. Now coming to our gospel lesson for this morning, where Peter asks, how often should we forgive? Jesus says 77 times, but this is not a literal number. In the Bible, seven is always a perfect number, and, and a multiple of seven is, is seen also as perfect. By saying 77 times, Jesus is saying to us every time. We are to forgive time and time again because God has forgiven us time and time again. And then Jesus tells that parable about the king and the slave. Now, 10,000 talents, that was more money than you and I would ever see in a lifetime. Whereas a few hundred denarii, hmm? hundred dollars. We are called to forgive because like the steward, the slave, we have been forgiven a great sum, millions of dollars. But our neighbor's sin, that's like 50 or a hundred bucks next to the millions that we owe God. So just as the king forgave the servant, the servant was expected to forgive those around him. Of course, forgiveness is easier said than done, isn't it? I mean, how do we forgive those who have hurt us? How do we let go of the anger and the hurt when we have been betrayed? Especially when we are, be when we are betrayed by those who are called to love us the most. One, it takes a conscious decision. And it takes prayer. It means looking upon the one who hurt you as a child made in the image of God. Just like we are. And it takes prayer. Lots and lots and lots of prayer. Philip Yancey's book is a call for Christians to reclaim and proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And that means practicing grace with those around us. And reclaiming and proclaiming the grace of God means forgiving 77 times and more. It means remembering the way in which God has already forgiven us. God forgives. Every unkind thought, every unfinished task or forgotten task, every selfish action, every wound we inflict on the world around us. God forgives us every time because God loves us. God loves us to death and to resurrection. Amen. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Thou reignest in glory, thou dwellest in light, 
find angels adore thee, all filling their sight. All that we would render, oh, help us to see, is only the splendor of thy tide at thee. Continue now with the Apostles' Creed. Please join me in reciting these ancient words, these words that are over a thousand years old, as we remember our baptism and what it is that we truly believe. Our Father, we believe in we believe in one God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who for our sake was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. On the third day, he rose again. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Continue now with the prayers of the church. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Holy God, you welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Strengthen faith through Bible studies and Sunday school, confirmation classes and youth ministries. Nurture new ministries of education and growth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The heights of heaven show us the vastness of your steadfast love. Have compassion on your creation. Where human selfishness has brought ruin and destruction, we look to you to heal, to renew, and to redeem your world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring healing and justice wherever harm is dealt. Provide vindication for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who are hungry and guard refugees fleeing famine, poverty, and war. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Still our hearts when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. Make this congregation a community of mercy for one and for all of our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring healing and wholeness to all, especially Cheryl, Wendell, Linda and family, Jeremy and Brianne, Patsy, Wyman and Tony, Kim, Bernice, Patsy, Juanita, Ezel, Shelby, Malia, Anne, Francis, Danell, Wilford, Joe, Barry, Bernice, Gloria, and Gordon, Morgan, Ellie Jane, Pat and Steve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
compassionate God, comfort, support and strengthen all who serve the sick, especially those placing their lives at risk as they care for those who have contracted this wretched virus. In their concerns and fears, may they know your peace. In their faithful serving, may they know your steadfast love. May they not grow weary or faint-hearted, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Unifying God, our country is divided. There is much anger and hate. Help us to see our neighbor as one who bears your image. Help us to listen and understand each other. May we be witnesses of your love in our community, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, be with our police officers. Keep them safe and guide them in their desires to be peacemakers. Especially, Lord, I pray for the two officers in Los Angeles who are fighting for their lives after being shot point blank by someone who ambushed them in their sitting patrol car. I pray, Lord, for the family and friends of the young deputy in Henderson, North Carolina, who was shot and killed this past week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, be with those affected by Hurricane Laura, those affected by the fires out west. Be with those who have lost homes and businesses, who have lost loved ones. And Lord, I pray that you would bring rain, and I pray, Lord, that you would help bring these fires into control, that you would help them to be put out. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Whether we live or whether we die, we are yours. We thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness, for the knees that taught us how to bow to you and the tongues that taught us to praise the Lord in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things, Lord, and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Please remember to like our page, share this video if you found it helpful. Thank you and God bless.